Arjuna Dalmia, Esas Woman of Delhi, welcome all of you to Right Circle event organized by the Prabha Ketan Foundation in association with the India International Center and Esas Women of Delhi. The event is supported by our distinguished patron, Sri Cement Limited, under their CSR initiative. We look forward to a soul-stirring and fascinating session with Devdeep Ganguly and Gautam Chikramane. Uh, these are distinguished academicians and researchers and whose scholarly work on Rishi Aurobindo shall be discussed. In conversation with them is our Ahsas woman from Dehradun, Pooja Marwa. Before the session starts, allow me to say a few words about the Prabhakitan Foundation, which was established in Kolkata in 1980, in the 80s, by the eminent entrepreneur, philanthropist, feminist, thinker, and writer, late Dr. Prabhakitan. Inspired by the golden philosophy of its founder, Karm Hi Jeevan Hai, or Work is Life, the foundation has charted a glorious journey of 40 years with a bouquet of boutique initiatives and festivals. Currently, the organization conducts various programs and activities in the field of art, culture, education, wildlife conservation, literature promotion in more than 50 cities of the country and worldwide. Under Apni Bhasha Apne Log campaign, the foundation organizes various literary programs like An Author's Afternoon, The Rights Circle, The Universe, The Universe Rights, Kitab, Akhar, Kalam, and Loves. Art, music, cultural events include Ek Milakat, or Sa Sur or Saz, Tetati, and Chopal. The aim of the foundation is to provide a platform for writers and artists to a niche and global audience through its book launches, authors meets, panel discussions, and literature festivals. In all the activities, the foundation enjoys the noble patronage of Sri Cement, Cement Limited and support of Associates and SRS Women of India. It's my pleasure to introduce today's eminent scholars, Devdeep Ganguly. It's my pleasure to introduce today's eminent scholars, Devdeep Ganguly and Gautam Chikramane, whose book reading Sri Aurobindo contains contributions of 21 people who are teachers, writers, politicians, thinkers, and editors who are well-versed and well-read and have engaged in his texts and discourses. Devdeep Ganguly teaches various aspects of Sri Aurobindo's philosophy to undergraduate students at the Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education, Pondicherry. He's also engaged with universities in India and international institutes offering courses and lectures related to Sri Aurobindo's writings. Devdeep is the co-editor with Gautam Chikarmani of Reading Sri Aurobindo, which was published by Penguin in 2022, in which all the volumes of the complete works of Sri Aurobindo are introduced for the first time to a wider public. Gautam Chikarmani is Vice President at Observer Research Foundation. His areas of research are economics, foreign policy, the Mahabharat, and Sri Aurobindo. His new books are Reform Nation by HarperCollins in 2022 and Reading Sri Aurobindo by Penguin in 2022, co-edited with Devdeep Ganguly. He's a student of Drupad Music. In conversation with Devdeep Ganguly and Gautam Chikarmane will be Pooja Marwa, our Ehsas woman of Dehradun. Pooja is a very keen literary enthusiast. 
So let's begin the session. Over to you, Pooja. Can I request everybody to switch off their phones, please? Thank you so much, Arjunadi. And thank you all for being here. I think, um, and I'm sure Gautam and uh, Devdeep would agree with me when I say that um, we are blessed, I think, this Saturday evening to be sitting here uh, talking about the magnificent aura of Sri Aurobindo. So he was born of, as a middle son to a family in Calcutta, to the Ghosh family. He went on to London, uh, to England to study. He was invited by the then Maharaja of Gaikwad to teach English, also do his speeches, after which he was jailed in Alipur because of he this is something we're going to get to, but he bombed the magistrate's carriage, just to give a little recap. And then in jail, he gets this epiphany, uh, which kind of coerces him to shift to Bondicherry and finally settle there. So who was Sri Aurobindo? Was he an economist? Was he a social reformer? Was he a freedom fighter? Who was he? Was he to, was he to India maybe what, what Shakespeare is to English? Um, either one of you can take it. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you very much. And uh, I have done several uh, book talks on reading Sri Aurobindo over the past one year. It was launched on 15th August uh, 2022, uh, which is also Sri Aurobindo's birthday, apart from being India's Independence Day. 75th, right? That's why no. you coincided 75th, it. 75th Independence Day and, and 150th, 150th, 150th birth anniversary. Yeah. Uh, but never have I seen such uh, enthusiasm and such uh, energy uh, for, uh, for Sri Aurobindo, who in my opinion has been mercilessly cancelled over the past 75 years. Our book is a small attempt to revive this great personality. Um, you said he's a freedom fighter, he's a thinker, philosopher. Is what he's being known as. So who was he yeah. really? So he was all of the above. And uh, to define him is uh, uh, what we call him, we call him as the supramental sage, which we will get to as we uh, go through his philosophy and his spirituality through the discussion. Uh, to me, um, there are nine, I mean, we all know that there are nine um, philosophical traditions of yeah. India, Astik, Nastik, Jainism, Buddhism, uh, Sankhya, etc., Vedic. To my mind, and I'm still exploring this thought, and if there are any such scholars around, uh, they may join this effort. Sri Aurobindo typifies the 10th Indian philosophical tradition, uh, which again, uh, we, as we discuss further, uh, I, I will, both of us probably can elaborate. What his, life story, his life story, uh, as far as the external part goes, as in the third son, UK, jail, freedom fighter, is according to him, nothing. His real life story is the one which is inside. It's of inner lives. And there is a unity with everybody else, which is part of his yoga, uh, the integral yoga. So uh, yeah, you can, you can get a chronology of Sri Aurobindo, but you can't get the life of Sri Aurobindo uh, through, through these chronological. Uh, but one thing I think what I really enjoy uh, about him is that he's not a religion. He doesn't force you to convert or, or to believe because he's, he's not telling you that this is the law and you follow it blindly. He's giving you reason. So Devdeep, if you were to tell me what inspired um, this repertoire of essays, there are so many volumes uh, on him. There are 36 volumes, if I'm correct. So why surmise it into 1921 yes. chapters? So I another way of looking at Sri Aurobindo, and I think that there are really uh, I for a personality like him that you know that touches upon the infinite there are infinite ways of of approaching and understanding understanding him and even then it's just, just a glimpse that we can get so one way that I see him is as a revolutionary I'll take the word but I will say he was a revolutionary not only in the political sense which he was he was one of the uh, very early um, uh, people in the freedom movement that made the demand for complete independence 
but he was also a revolutionary in the spiritual sense and when we come to talking about his his yoga we'll see and i i i'm glad you touched upon it because he does not seek to formulate a new religion he uh, he, he it's a unique way in which he values the past of indian culture in its entirety but his vision is clearly forward looking he's not looking to the past in order to bring back a glorious age but looking to the past in order to build a foundation for which something new which has really which is really unique to this age and to modernity so i think with the story this coincidence of 75 and 150th i think is very symbolic because the rise of modern india is closely connected in my mind with the story of shirobindo and his vision so this is one part of the okay. the, the question uh, why reading shirobindo i think gautam is the right person because i i have to be honest he initiated the project so it's best that he speaks about but before we yes. talk of the project what yes. i want to say is because there were so many dimensions to shri aurobindo why would you choose upon reading aurobindo why not another adjective so one thing is that one of his most precious legacies is he left he has left behind 36 volumes it's a it's a huge body of work which runs into how many pages 21000 21000 pages 6, 6 million, million words. words it touches upon an extraordinarily diverse number of topics starting from his political writings to poetry to literature playwright um Scriptures. the the yeah. commentaries on the vedas the upanishads the gita uh, texts on uh, translations from bengali from tamil i mean it's uh, from latin from greek because he was educated in cambridge so he had a thorough uh, western grounding but he came back to india and plunged into sanskrit and bengali and started writing in those languages as well just briefly but english was his mainstay okay. and he also <coughs> evolved this new perspective of yoga and so the, the, and then there are letters on yoga correspondence it's an extraordinarily rich uh, range of material so we felt that uh we we both work with ideas and writing so we felt that for the 150th our contribution would be to invite more people to engage with these ideas because um i i do agree with gautam in the sense that it is strange we are 75 years into independence we are seeking for our identities a fresh we are decolonizing ourselves and i think it's a very crucial juncture where do we go from here we don't want to you know mimic our colonial past nor do we want to at least in my mind revert to some uh, any any sort of regressive uh, world view so what is an indian world view that is uh, suited to the modern context for me the answer is shirobindo yes modi's vision of vishwaguru the 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 whole idea of vishwaguru india as a vishwaguru yeah. in the yeah. true sense in not the in the political the not yeah. in the political yeah. or, uh, or the debating society yeah. or on tv debates kind of sense but in the ethos the the what is the essence of india the ethos of india what is india what is the indian way it comes uh, what is this uh, mm, uh, what is this magical thing that india is going to transform the world this comes from shri aurobindo come on. and at the same time i'm sorry no, uh, and at the same time while being so you can say rooted in a sense to the indian story he was very international yeah. he truly believed in a world where the countries of the world can come together live together he valued the role that each nation had to play in the collectivity of the world that's how oroville came about right yes when when the mother made oroville okay so godam uh, back to you there is this statement that you say that if uh, you are dealing with a reality that is complex then no one simplifies that complex reality like shri aurobindo what was it that you were trying to convey through that through everyday life uh, is that something that you know we should kind of read him and kind of get inferences on okay, how to uh, live life so i don't know where you've got that sentence but it sounds <laughs> like my yeah, it's your <laughs> 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 it's yours it sounds like my sentence it's it's uh, but i don't recall uh, saying it but nonetheless i think when you read shri aurobindo kitabi karwa interview Achha, online uh, thank you <laughs> so uh, i think when you read shri aurobindo uh, his words uh, to put it uh, for lack of any better vocabulary and since we are all here and we all of us are no um what the vedas are what upanishads are even if you haven't deeply engaged with them shri aurobindo's words i find personally uh, to be mantrik in their essence uh, 
uh, there are uh, sometimes it's difficult to read more than one paragraph. Uh, his his biggest work is Savitri. Uh, it's a it's a huge poem. And I personally, having read Sri Aurobindo regularly for the past 20, from 2000, so about more than two decades, I've been reading Sri Aurobindo every day without fail. Find it very difficult to read Savitri. And I'm not saying reading as in I don't understand the words or the, or the textures or the layers. It's just that there is a mantric quality where you sense a presence and it's I, I'm talking about myself. Devdeep has read Savitri, right? You managed to read it. I haven't. I get blissed out. On the other hand, uh, y you have other books, philosophical books, uh, like essays in philosophy and yoga. You have spiritual books like Life Divine um, or Synthesis of Yoga. You have scriptural works like essays on the Gita, uh, Secret of the Veda. You have hard uh, political works like Karma Yogin or Bande Mataram. In fact, he's the person who translated uh, Bankim's uh, po uh, poem to in, into English, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Anandamat. Yeah. So, and with all this, what I'm finding is that when you read Sri Aurobindo, for lack of better word, Sri Aurobindo also reads you. And there is a transformation that happens inside you if you uh, approach Sri Aurobindo with the hermeneutics of faith or the hermeneutics of respect rather than the common, the Western tradition of the hermeneutics of suspicion. When you do that, and as Indians, we are naturally inclined to do it. When we pick up the Gita, we don't say, oh, cynically, ah, what does this mean? Uh, is Krishna asking Arjun to kill people? You, know, you don't do these silly things. You understand the, we naturally are inclined to understand spiritual principles easily. We are brought up, our culture, our parents, our grandparents, our stories, uh, our engagements are more, more uh, down to earth, more uh, part of the heart. So when you read, when I read Sri Aurobindo, it becomes mantric and it kind of transforms you. And that transformation that you're talking about, how it affects me, right? Yeah. Th that's your question. Yeah. It affects me in every possible way. It affects my writing. It affects the way I engage with people. Uh, to me, there is an outer engagement that happens and then there is a deeper engagement also that one has to be conscious of. We are right. sitting here right now. Yeah. There is a, a, an engagement happening here. There is an engagement happening there. It's not that I'm giving a lecture and somebody is listening. I can hear questions already. There is this uh, a deeper engagement, which is the psychic or the more than just these words or these ideas that are coming out. That transformation process, that the entire life, one of the mantras you can call is all life is yoga. This too is yoga. Now, we are not doing any uh, those twist and uh, arm bending exerciser, etc. But this is yoga too. Yoga, yoga is, mind, the is the union. And that union is a, is a union of all of us with the spirit. So when you talk about integral yoga, and I think uh, Devdeep, you'll be able to explain it better. The, the, integral, the integrality of his yoga is not an admixture of karma yoga, faith, um, bhakti yoga, or... Uh, Heart yoga, it's, it's, it's yeah. not a, it's not a um, you know, you take one from here, one from here. It's the next level of yoga itself, where the starting point, for instance, um, sorry to just go on like this, but the starting, uh, uh, the end point of most other yogas is nirvana, right? For Sri Aurobindo, that is the starting point. It's having attained nirvana, you have to bring that consciousness down into the earth, into a material the very cells of our body. You have to divinize matter. That, that divinizing of matter is where you understand several things that somehow would escape you. I, I'm talking about myself again, and each of you have, have your own path. Uh, you, to imagine that you do all this, and this is all maya, and then you go on, and then you dissolve yourself into the higher consciousness, and that's the end of it, seemed a little strange to me yeah. uh, uh, until very late when I discovered Sri Aurobindo, or let me say Sri Aurobindo discovered me. It's only now that I'm beginning to realize the th mentally, what this whole evolutionary process is all about. Evolution has not ended with us. Yeah. We are a transition being. So going up there into the consciousness through aspiration and the descent of that consciousness through grace is integral yoga, one aspect of integral yes, in, yoga. In order to affect real things, it's not simply something that happens in a space of withdrawal. It's to affect the, our life, our work, our relations, our body. All of that has to ultimately change or transform through that process. So Devdeep, tell me, uh, your family and you have been involved with the ashram 
uh, if I may say so, literally from birth, right? So how do you... Three generations. Three generations. So how would you or how do you look at Sri Aurobindo with an unbiased view? I don't. I don't you claim don't. to have an unbiased view at all. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, I, I grew up in an environment where uh, it, was, it was my you know, light and air. And it's just that um, I, I just feel lucky that at a, at a formative stage, I got interested in reading. Interested now, in reading, I'm going to <laughs> point out a very funny story about him here is, I think he was 10 or 11 and it was Christmas uh, in Pondicherry and uh, he was given in his little Christmas bag a book on the Upanishads which he understood nothing of it at 10 but he tried to read it just so you know I think one page at a time so he could sound or appear to be more intelligent <laughs> so was yeah. that your uh, the your first reading no, of I, so I somehow instinctively felt that this this is something magical and mysterious about all these nice beautiful words. sounding <laughs> words which I don't understand so uh, I think that I was just lucky that when I began reading Shrobindo a lot of people have this complaint that oh his writing is too difficult I'm just yeah. I keep hearing right, this and right. because I now I teach in, in, <coughs> in universities in India and abroad I, I you know engage with these texts and so when I hear this in fact what in my experience I find that the response is very varied there are people who have not had much uh, you know who may not have PhDs in English literature or whatever else simple basic knowledge of English they pick up and sometimes they say no it's what's the problem uh, you may not understand some words but now you can easily look them up and then there are others who are very very knowledgeable they have read a lot and sometimes they read and they say oh what is this sen sentence construction why is it so long big I feel that taking it forward from what Gautam was saying he wrote in a way in which words were not just ideas but an action it were a force in action and so the writing conveys to you not just a thought but also a very strong feeling and um, once you can align yourself to that vibration or way of reading or style of reading there is a very uh, a, a very beautiful experience so I think um, I w when I grew up in Pondicherry and um, is which doesn't mean that uh, you know everyone who grows up in Pondicherry loves to read Shrobindo per se right, we all have course. our different uh, yeah. and in fact with Shurabindo reading is not the only way even you can have so many other practices of your own but for me personally it was revolution uh, a revelatory in terms of the worlds that I was exposed to through his writings so if I was to ask uh, both of you collectively that um, which I mean he has a lot of philosophies but which one of his philosophies if you were to kind of pick out kind of moved you or changed you in the course of writing this book? I think you take that question. I can't answer this no, question. No, this <laughs> <one is for> <laughs> <you>. <laughs> <laughs> See, he, <coughs> he has fundamentally one perspective, which is the integral yoga. So it's not as if he has different philosophies. He has one vision of things. This vision of things is based on an evolutionary perspective. But why do you call it integral yoga? Because yes. Yes. No. Yeah. Yeah. No. no that was my yeah, question. Yeah. So. So I'll I'll explain. So, as Gautam was saying for Shrobindo, he looked back at the Indian tradition and he read these texts. He learned Sanskrit. He went deep into them. Wrote commentaries, and then he said, "Look, there seems to be a problem. We seem to have associated spirituality with a rejection of life. Mm. We have associated spirituality with a withdrawal." from life so which means you have to go away to the Himalayas or to, uh, to the forests or to an ashram and <coughs> Shrobindo felt that this was not one he felt that this is not the only interpretation of the texts and the second thing he said is that what is its place in a new world in a new modern world and so he said look if you read the texts in an unbiased way they don't necessarily suggest that you have to reject the world and when he wrote his commentaries on the Upanishads, for example, my one of my favorite texts of Shrobindo is his commentary on the Isha Upanishad. And when he wrote that, he, he says, look, read the Isha Upanishad, which says, engage with the world, live, live to be a hundred, right? Um, and still arrive at a certain realization. So why integral yoga? So one aspect of the integral yoga is, is it integrates spirit and matter. It integrates 
the spiritual realm and the ordinary consciousness which we normally live in, all of us. And the other aspect of the in integration is that he basically said there is no one way. So this, of course, is something we are familiar we with know, in yeah. the Indian tradition. And he said each of these methods are legitimate and valid. Further, there is no one part of the being with which we have to start. Someone can work through their body. Let's say you are really invested in your body in terms of developing it, making it strong, uh, building it, uh, doing exercises, sports or whatever. Even that can be a process of yoga if it is done with consciousness. So in other words, anywhere consciousness enters, whether it is physical work, body, the emotions, relationships, the mind, thoughts, ideas, each of these are legitimate. I'll so just take that, I'll just uh, pull that from you. But it is not the only way. So it's not like Hercules would attain everything if his mental faculties are not developed. So the integral yoga comprises the physical. It's a very essential component because without the physical, you cannot receive the force. The physical is very, cru it's crucial, but it's not sufficient. Uh, your mental faculties, your vital faculties, emotions, your psychic faculties all have to grow together. So that integral, we are all integral beings in the process of evolution. We are transitional beings is what Sri Aurobindo calls. So that evolution is happening. The paths are several, but if you go on one side and you ignore the mental or you do the mental and you ignore the emotional, you will find dissonance. Much of the problems around us, as you may all have know, known, uh, through the great Indian families, uh, you will all have uh, ghar ghar ki kahani. Uh, you will see these uh, con conflicts play out in various aspects around you, within you, uh, to people closest to you, to people farthest from you, around, uh, to people who you see as leaders, to people who you, uh, uh, you work, who are your workers, etc. You will see these dissonances. That's because of the lack of integration. So one part of Sri Aurobindo's yoga is an in the integrality of the being with all the layers, all the complexities around that being coming together into a cohesive um, manifestation. And just one sentence, I think Shobindo was someone who was not satisfied with any uh, simple, what shall we say, achievement. He really wanted everything. All of it has to change. We have to arrive at a world or a, or a state of being which is truly um, revolutionary in that sense. Gautam mentioned the word transitional and if you look at the world that we live in, it's broadly born out of modernity. We are all, for all our Indianness and all the rest, we are essentially shaped mentally by this modernity. If you've read uh, Heidegger and Foucault and all the rest, they will tell you how this objectivization of the universe, like we see the universe and the world separate from us, this is a feature of modernity. And the the world, when we, when we look at it, our political systems, our social systems, our educational systems, which are born out of this perspective, are deeply problematic. Because we are, we are not able to find a solution. We have experimented with various isms, communism, uh, you know, etc., etc. But we find that each one solves one problem, creates ten others. And so, also transitional being because Shrabindo says as long as we function through that mental framework of modernity there is a problem we will the mind is not the final solution it has to open to something deeper and higher that that doesn't mean you 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 uh, you uh, suppress the mind set it free uh, no uh, many 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 people misunderstand this or in their inertia and tamas tamasic nature say that oh i don't need to think I'll be taken care of. No, no you, you to need to transcend the mind. You don't have to smother the mind. And I think the Sri Aurobindo Ashram or Auroville that you were asking about is a, is a manifestation of that. When you go there, you don't see people uh, sitting in tapasya doing, uh, following any discipline whatsoever. Full it is just a very it's open thing. So you may be sitting, he may be standing, somebody would be sleeping, another working, somebody growing plants, somebody in the paper factory, somebody uh, in the archives putting out things together, each of which is an expression of the yoga. Now my apologies to all the men, gentlemen sitting here and both of you, but I feel that my next question is going to be pro-women because I think ev behind every man, even Sri Aurobindo, there was always a woman. So I don't think we can speak of Sri Aurobindo without mentioning Meera Alfasa, who was given the, the title of the mother. 
so this lady a foreigner she comes she gets this uh, vision uh, where she sees uh, sri aurobindo as a guru or an avatar am i right so and she also i believe at some point when she first met him had said that like when you were to come or take birth uh, on earth there were many rishis gurus munis waiting to kind of take birth at the same time that you are here just like hanuman and angad had done for lord ram how much of truth is there in this so yes. th was there really a soul cluster is there a story or how did meera alfasa i e the mother get that vision that she walks up to him and says you are the guru so before you start devdeep <laughs> I, I, wa i want to uh, uh, give you a news point yes please do you 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 will get a detailed answer 5 years later when we write another book uh, on the 150th birth anniversary of the mother of the mother <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> um you know in uh, as gautam was saying some of these spiritual concepts it's really very easy when you're engaging with an in indian or an indic audience because the same thing when it's asked in other contexts yeah. i struggle so i'll give you a, an, anal an analogy which is kind of uh, which no not uh, hopefully not but i really convey what i'm trying to say so we have this ishwara and shakti like you have this idea of the principle and the manifestation of the principle and there's this beautiful um, short sentence which the mother wrote in one of her messages which i which is which conveys to us the relationship the true relationship between shrobindo and the mother and she wrote um without without him i exist not and without me he's unmanifest and if you go back to the spiritual traditions of india this is an this is a theme or an idea which which is quite you can say universal so you have this so shrobindo was somebody who was of course writing and doing his yoga and sort of bringing you know working on himself and 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 the community that was growing around him in pondicherry but it was not until Mira Alfasa or the mother as she was known she is known in the community and it was it was not until the mother came to Pondicherry that she actually gave shape to that vision so she was really the manifesting force that created the ashram that created the ashram school which is a radical experiment in education it's a, it's absolutely uh, very special because i mean not just because i grew up there uh, by the way i grew up in delhi till the age of 9 okay and then i moved to pondicherry to the ashram school um and then uh the an orville so these are all you can say manifestations of shirobindo's vision and she was not just an administrator or a organizer she brought it to life y yeah in a way she made it manifest for instance uh, yes. let's like education the, if you read shirobindo's uh, i think it's in early cultural writings uh, 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 a national education he has a curriculum for a national education what it should be how it should be uh, thought through uh, how for instance i'll just give you one small example that uh, education begins from near near to far right near to far inside to outside and um, a third principle so when a child is suddenly given the abstract alphabet versus a child being engaging with say water soil um Uh, or uh, the the earth at, uh, or the the skies birds etc the kind of knowledge systems that develop inside the child are different uh, rather than throwing him into the, uh, the you know abcd 1 2 3 4 etc etc now there is a ethos of this education system which then mother um refines into a uh, uh, five kinds of education which is the physical mental vital psychic and spiritual so when here is the core idea there is its manifestation in terms of how to do it many people say shri aurobindo is very difficult to read right so our answer to this, so what should we read so our answer to them is if you find shri aurobindo difficult to read read the mother if you find mother difficult to read read our book <laughs> <laughs> so you know i'm going to go back to you right in the beginning gautam you men uh, mentioned savitri is a poem written by shri aurobindo which is the longest poem uh till date in the world no right? no, no no longest is the mahabharat okay uh, but the mahabharat but um, um, in the english language in the english, in the english language, language. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, shri aurobindo's it is shri aurobindo's largest work and, and it's one of the lo longest poems uh, english. in english language so he um, he believes that savitri was actually a story of life and death right savitri and satyavan so 
he also uh, somewhere i remember reading has said this is something i remember since i was a child that it is actually the mother and his story that they kind of manifested together and savitri kind of came about because of that is uh, there so i'm, I'm, I'm not certain it, about that this yeah, way yeah. let me put it this way that he uses the story of of satyavan and ashwapati and savitri as a symbol to convey the inner work and life of sh of of himself and of the mother the role of the mother also okay. so it's not as if i i think we should not read this this we this is a truth but i think we should not read too much, too much into into, it, into yeah. it and try and you know make it very precise but for sure so here is something interesting for someone who had such extraordinary spiritual experiences shobindo hardly ever spoke about them in the first person he could write about them but he never spoke about them in the first person saying oh this happened to me or oh, that i did this great thing happened A except in the uttar para speech yes. so in the uttar para speech is the first and only time that in public he spoke about a spiritual experience that took place in alipur jail which you referred to in the beginning yeah. so he had this absolutely you know transformative vision of vasudeva or shri krishna he saw krishna yes yeah. in in everything around him he was he was being tried as one of the most dangerous the british called him the Criminal. most dangerous uh, you know person in the british empire and he was facing almost certain death and all of that and he says the first few days he was a little confused and agitated in the sense that why how is this happening i am supposed to do the work of independence and now i am in prison and then he has this vision and uh, after that he says he completely withdraws into a sense of peace and silence other than the uttapara speech he never spoke publicly about his spiritual experiences he wrote sometimes to disciples so for example questions like i am struggling with this difficulty what do i do so to that person in a private correspondence he might write do this do this when i was doing this i had a similar thing etc etc savitri is in a sense interesting because though it's not in first person it speaks of you get a, a sense like gautam was saying a feeling that oh my god here is somebody who has had extraordinary experiences and realizations because otherwise you can't write like that and Savit savitri is a detailed account of his yoga from the point a to point b the visions that you see the struggles that you have the griefs that you en encounter the joys that come uh, the levels of consciousness the every th that uh, that it's a, it's a it's it captures everything i mean it's the mantra okay. and, uh, 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 and and it has everything it has re been revised eight times some pages have been done several times over i have seen those corrections in fact if you go through this book you must not uh, ignore the 31 uh, pages that are there there is for the first time they have been put out in, in public some the, some the, ma in the, the, the raw the raw manuscripts are there you will see the corrections savitri is his work of absolute perfection it is his yoga it encapsulates shri aurobindo's yoga completely from point a if you're starting on this journey savitri is your starting point provided you can uh, you can uh, read can it considering yeah. you could, you anyway. said you couldn't read yeah, savitri yeah, i still can't i still can't so he says he couldn't read savitri and devdeep on the other side uh, says that i read one page of savitri every day for 10 years so and they both wrote the book together so you know coming back to you devdeep on krishna uh, there is this story about uh, general roosevelt's daughter margaret who uh, had read this uh, who had read his book essays i think on the gita and she said that uh, nobody but krishna could have written that in fact she was so inspired by it that she came down to pondicherry and is even Uh, buried there not in the ashram so what was the connection between roosevelt and shri aurobindo yeah so actually it was woodrow wilson president woodrow wilson's daughter um <coughs> so so um this was just after the first world war and um um and she she was obviously uh, in washington and uh, in in the white house and all of that but then after her father passed away um uh long story short in a library in new york as she was reading up different spiritual texts she came upon another extraordinary work which we have covered in our book called the life divine the life divine is shri aurobindo's philosophical statement of his yoga 
uh, uh, not just of his yoga but of his world vision so like if you want to know what is what is shravindo's vision for humanity and the world life divine is your book so she read the life divine and um, it was transformatory for her she wrote a letter in those days mail to shravindo saying i have read this this book and it's something which is you know absolutely moved me very much there was also i think she also read essays on the gita uh which is of that's course what i had read that yeah. she had read on essays of the gita yeah. and that's where she found the inference between krishna and she or uh, yes so yeah. so they were, they were she read quite a few different books and then she wrote to shrobindo saying i really want to come and meet you and i would like to come and stay in the ashram now at that point of time shrobindo was not uh, seeing any visitors and he didn't break the rule for her either okay. he was there were only four days a year when people had the darshan which meant a quiet silent passing and even today those four days his room is opened to the public and so on but and shrobindo also wrote to her saying that here the conditions are very simple a uh, pondicherry of the 1930s is not pondicherry of today today it's a bustling cosmopolitan modern town and so on those days it's a forgotten little back of the beyond place um very hot uh, uh humid um the ashram was also very simple in its uh, infrastructure and so on so shrobindo kind of said look i'm warning you that it will not it will not be easy for you but if you want to come you may come she not only came but she even settled in pondicherry and she remained till the end of her life in the yeah. 1940s she's still buried there right yes yeah. yes and um lived an absolutely simple life no uh, there was no kind of what shall i say uh ex- extra extra yeah. attention or importance given to the daughter of the american president living in pondicherry Bondi. back then nobody even knew uh, most pe- i mean hardly anyone knew and um, she did her work and uh, one of the things that she used to that she was tasked with was washing the dishes that shrobindo used to eat Eaten. the vessels oh, okay. and dishes so she did the most you can say you know pious in a way uh, i yeah. mean the it's a physical work in menial yeah, yeah. a menial, menial yeah. kind of work menial, and yeah. and you so you can imagine somebody president's daughter brought yeah. up in that environment coming to pondicherry place with uh, erratic electricity at that time it's just i i i find it very i mean it's very inspiring in its own way yeah. so gautam this one's for you uh shri aurobindo and the mother are one entity so there are two distinct symbols that both of them have at the ashram what do those symbols mean and why do they have two distinct symbols like shri aurobindo has those two triangles and uh, the mother symbol has a circle with uh, i think 24 uh, kind of partitions so why would they have two distinct uh, symbols that's an amazing question and n- nobody's ever asked me this question why two different but let me try and decode the two symbols for you at least Uh, Shri Aurobindo's symbol uh, is about his yoga, the integral yoga. Uh, there are two triangles uh, going on, each, uh, you know, one, b- one pointing, pointing up. up, one yeah, pointing one down, with a square in the middle. Uh, the one going up is the aspiration. The one coming down is the grace, and there is a lotus with seven petals. Yeah, so there. where they meet is the perfect square, I, I, and that, that's the square. and there is lotus with seven levels of consciousness in it so that is the symbolic representation of his yoga mother's uh, symbol has four it has a, a, a central four point s- uh, central, central point. point then there are four, four aspects, aspects and uh, 12 qualities c- qualities uh, these are humility and uh, four courage she refers to. so these are all i mean these are all in spiritual practice yeah. you have all a symbol is always a way of conveying or communicating that's right no, i understand right. that it's, it's and so like for instance if you go to or if you go to the matri mandir those 12 pillars yeah, there, there are also uh, p- uh, the pillars of each of those uh, uh, forces the of of the mother and uh, that's how those two symbols are now why are they different i don't know i uh, <laughs> devdeep put okay next book <laughs> you let us know <laughs> Mother. I think one is the philosophical or the spiritual uh, <laughs> core the other is the manifestation in our day to day lives. Yeah. Okay, thank <coughs> you. There's also a very interesting thing that I read. You know when we talk of Aurobindo uh, there is a part there are a segment of people who just think that it's spiritual. But there's so much about Aurobindo with even Hitler. For example. Now, Hitler during World War 
I am going to ask you that. Sorry, but I am going to ask you anyway, and Gautam is going to answer this. So uh, Hitler believed in occultism, right? So he used to get these insights or spirits that you know used to come inside his brain and tell him that you know, cha, it's it's li literally like, aaj utho acha attack this country, attack that country. So there was this dilemma at one time in um, in Hitler's mind uh, when he had to kind of choose between England and Russia, and before the spirits could reach his mind. It is believed that Sri Aurobindo, uh, through his thoughts, enters and tells him to attack Russia, and he attacks Russia. And I've read this somewhere, so I I can't remember where. So but since yeah, you guys I are the I'm maestros, I'll, I'll be very honest. I'm wary about talking about things I don't understand. That's right. Yeah. So so what I can say is that I, I, this is this is part of the. I mean, I have heard this too. We've read this. It's part of the sort of. It's, it's, it's no, it's not. You're not making no, it's it. It's up. a fact. No, no, no it's not. not you're not making it up. It's yeah, part yeah, of the yeah. sort of mythology yeah, yeah, of yeah. the place. Yeah. Yeah. All I can say is that look, when when um, when I use the word mythology, I don't mean it in the sense of uh, falsehood. I mean it in the sense of the stories around various things. All I can say is that w where we are, to for us to speak about occult realities. Uh, becomes just words, and it sounds like a. It, it becomes like a uh, almo almost cari a caricature. Okay. Uh, so, one thing is certain: Shirobindo was absolutely opposed to Hitler. He made public statements, and in fact, uh, many people were upset in India at the time, because, as you know, there were there were a faction of the Indian politicians who were. Uh, actually, looking upon the uh, the Axis powers as a potential counterweight to the British in India, so they said a common enemy is uh, you know our friend. Yeah. Um, Shrobindo was very clear, and he clearly said, "Look, whatever the political situation with the British and the uh, the Germans and all the rest, as far as this war is concerned, the Second World War is concerned, it is more than just a political battle." It represents a certain outcome, which is deeply problematic. If the Axis powers win with their ideology, you, you are all well aware of the various aspects of that ideology. He said that it is not only a victory um, of Hitler, but a victory of forces that would retard the evolutionary process of the Earth. You said we'll be all pushed back by hundreds of years. And so he came out publicly to say that I put my weight and I support entirely. He even, the the, the ashram even uh, contributed money to the war campaign, and for a lot of people it was shocking. Here is Shrobindo, the great anti-British revolutionary who fought this, who did this, and now he's contributing money to the to British the war, war yeah, effort. Yeah. I mean, what is this? What is this thing? But for him, he put that across by saying, "Look, don't judge this battle." From this narrow political perspective, there's a bigger picture which is much, much more dan you know, dangerous if that wins. And so, it is also true. There is a book that I can suggest if you are interested to know more about Shrobindo's views on the war and his role in the war. It's written by a disciple called Nirod Baran, and the name of the book is Twelve Years with Sri Aurobindo. So, Twelve Years with Sri Aurobindo is an account of this gentleman. Who was one of Shirobindo's personal attendants? Who was in his room every day, and he writes about what he saw and heard and felt during the war period. In fact, a lot of what you said comes from that book. So uh, all I can say is, look, if you're interested, please read Twelve Years with Shirobindo and then see for yourself what you make of it. Okay, I think we have to kind of wrap up, yes. but I have one quick last question uh, for you, which is. Won't we have questions from the audience? Yes, yes. <coughs> after this, okay. so um, there was a sevak in the ashram, Devdeep. No, not Devdeep. Dilip, sorry. <laughs> Dilip Kumar. He's, he's also a sevak. Yeah, Dilip <laughs> Kumar struggling, Roy. Struggling sevak. Yeah. <laughs> there was this sevak. I mean, I find why I I can relate to Sri Aurobindo is because I find him as humane as as all of us here. He doesn't come across as you know one of those sages that that are unreachable. Or you know, I find him that he what he practices, what he teaches, what he says, you can identify with them. So in the same way, there's this little story about his sevak, uh, Dilip uh, Roy, who was threatened, I think, when Mira Alfasa became the mother because he was very close to Sri Aurobindo, and uh, he kind of left the ashram for good, started his own uh, in Pune. So 
is that something that also happened or is that a story that is floating look it it's like this let me let me try this yes okay, okay. without being very specific about dilip okay fine I'm, uh, i take it that you know him then uh, there is you need to look at the shri aurobindo ashram as a microcosm as a, as a laboratory of consciousness now what does that mean it means it, it, it's not just people who are spiritually high or aware or uh, intellectually profound who will who you will find in the shri aurobindo ashram it has not been designed that way people like me can also join there it has been designed to contain all kinds of people who have all kinds of traits including ambitions including jealousy so when you see something happening in around the world for instance you will see that being magnified exponentially in the ashram and it is been said by the mother if the problem is resolved in the ashram it would have been resolved across the world ashrams uh, to that extent the laboratoriness of the shri aurobindo ashram or even auroville is a is a concentrated force of people coming together to fix various things in the as part of the evolutionary track of humans and once resolved there would get finished there now that's where your mr dilip comes into the play and there are several such who come and uh, go who uh, uh, you know uh, are rude uh, who, who are um, uh, you know, petty let me, let me say something let me say which something which is why he's no, no, wait, let me say something when people think of the word ashram right there's often a conception of some kind of a place of perfect people yeah, yeah, right yeah. so there are two things two things i have to say about the ashram and i'm from there so i'm allowed to say this the Biased, first but okay. no y- no no you will see the first is the first is that a, uh, a lot of people who come to the ashram in pondicherry are surprised that there is no compound there is no it's like most most tourists or visitors like if you don't know anybody there they will say we want to go to the shrobindo ashram they'll be taken into a old sort of colonial building which they enter they will see the samadhi which is where shrobindo and the mother's bodies were put to rest and it's a courtyard open courtyard they'll enter a bookstore and then they'll say what else is there to see and usually the person at the gate will be like there's nothing to see you know please go <laughs> and so, th- so, so uh, let me add that the, the rudest bunch of people <laughs> <laughs> you will find uh, on, on the frontiers of the shri aurobindo ashram <laughs> <laughs> no so the point is the point is that it's a very unconventional ashram of very unconventional masters right and well it is not a space where everyone comes together and does bhajan singing or everyone meditates together it's a as as gautam put it a laboratory of evolution which means a space where every human activity is sought to be done in a conscious way and if people who come to the ashram with the idea that they are going to meet extraordinary individuals i do believe there are extraordinary individuals in their own way but our our uh, uh, you know our uh, expectations of wanting to meet somebody who has you know perfect behavior or it's often stimid because human nature in 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 all its fullness if you are not willing to see it you cannot change it if you are going to hide from it and say i will only bring out that which is noble and beautiful in me and all the rest is going to hide somewhere else uh, then you are not working on it imperfections make you alive yes, i think yes yes and yeah. all that imperfection is there yeah. in in all its fullness the the s- the, the redeeming gra- factor or grace is that by and large everyone who is there is aware that they are imperfect and seeking to change themselves mm. so i would disagree with the second last idea i, I don't think everybody is aware that they are there uh, <laughs> imperfect <laughs> we are uh, we are going to thank you uh, so much but we are open uh, for questions I think the part yeah my name's Yogesh I think the most fascinating thing about Sri Aurobindo is that he brings in the you know the practical aspect of evolution of engaging with the world rather than the the usual thought in India about spirituality is that you try and connect and moksha you go poof right he's the guy who says you engage with the world the with the best as you said you bring the grace and divinity below and the best part is the documentation i think for people who are on that path he's the one who's given you like for any question that you have the book there is a book and an expression where uh, the outcome is there having said that 
and I speak to, uh, you know, just the introduction of Aurobindo in the larger engagement of India, people knowing, reading the books. Therefore, I think this is a great initiative. Where do you think that's lacking in a place which you said was a lab? You know, he brought these people together. You had Mother's Grace. Everything is there. And yet that understanding of people, the broad basing of that knowledge to really take it, take us yeah. to the next level. Because the charm is to engage with the world, right? And he gives you step by step principles, the way to do it. And yet we don't really see that outcome and that clarity coming from that ashram or that space itself, right? Just elaborate a bit more on that. So uh, I think the first part of that is that uh, after independence, Sri Aurobindo has been cancelled. And uh, uh, it, uh, just as uh, Vivekananda almost got cancelled, but somehow survived. But Sri Aurobindo has been totally cancelled. You look for academics. Let me give you one small example. About, um, Three weeks ago, one person I was at a lit at the Delhi Lit Fest talking about my other book, and one young man came to me saying that I wanted to meet you. I said, "Okay, what do you want to talk about?" He said, "I want to talk about reading Sri Aurobindo." The book I was talking about was on economics, but he wanted to talk about this book, and he needed some guidance. Who is he? He is the second person doing a PhD on Sri Aurobindo's nationalism and. Um, uh, nationalism and yoga, the second after Karan Singh did it 50 years ago. So we may have a PhD in Sri Aurobindo after 50 years. Can you imagine this kind of abomination in our own country for somebody who is so evolved, for this person, for Sri Aurobindo? This is what I mean by Sri Aurobindo being cancelled. I was delighted. I gave him all effort and I will continue and we will support him in every possible intellectual way that we possibly can. But just can you imagine this? In our country, our Rishi, our philosopher, our literary person, our freedom fighter, and there is only one PhD on that person. To give you context, on Shakespeare, there are 20,000 papers. On Shakespeare, on Jestor, on Sri Aurobindo, there is 141. Sorry, I was just wanting him to follow, continue that why do you think he was cancelled? No, I... Okay. Go for that. No, so I, I think... I think I, let me put it this way. Um, connecting both the questions. As far as Ashram and Auroville are concerned, those are living centres. They are like concentrated dynamic centres. So people who live there or who even who go to visit there, like they are regularly persons who might come to, ref to recharge themselves or refresh themselves. So they are kind of... They are kind of like... Um, places where uh, there is a concentration of effort the the broader question is why aren't these ideas more 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 uh, accessible available <coughs> engaged with i think part of the reason is also because of the circumstances of independence I, you know the, we forget sometimes just how fraught with confusion and complexity was the the process of independence so we are we are coming out of colonial rule, we are confused about our place in the world, we are trying to figure out how do we modernize ourselves, how do we hold on, you know, it's a very confusing process. And in the, in the, in the broad span of history, 75 years is nothing. So I feel like it is also a question of time. There's a time and place for everything and there is a certain preparation which is required to be open to certain ideas. And perhaps now that time has come. I do believe that now the time has come where, where, where for, the, for the first time after, I, I don't mean now, I mean over the last 30 years, over the last 30 years, now for the first time we feel that now we are growing, we are, our, our basics are being you know, addressed, we are, there's a lot of work to be done. But at least there is a feeling that yes, the material uh, thing has to be fall in place. Then we have the space and scope to talk about other things. We now we have the, the, the ability to say, all right, now what next? We are we are figuring out the, the roads and the ports and the airports and all the rest. It's, that's great. But now what next? What makes us human beings? What makes us Indians? You can't ask those questions as Swami Vivekananda said. You can't ask someone who, who doesn't have food in his stomach to be uh, to, to be pursuing spirituality. So he would tell the young people, go and play football instead. That is better for you. Build your bodies. So in the same sense, I would say in a national sense, we have to build ourselves and then there is scope for asking more profounder engagement. True. 
मैंने कहीं पढ़ा है डिटेल में नहीं पढ़ा आप थोड़ा बताइए मैंने एक बेसिकली जो उनका जो कहना था वो ये था कि जब वो सुपरामेंटल डिसेंट होगा रेवोल्यूशन की पूर्ण पूर्ण होगा उन दोनों को एक एकत्रित जब करते हुए व्हेन वी टॉक कि क्या होगा वो आज भी हमें नहीं पता कि वो सुपरामेंटल बीइंग क्या होगा आप समझे नहीं मेरी बात मैंने तो वो जब वो आएंगे जो जो बदलाव होने वाला है वो एनर्जी बॉडी से एनर्जी सेंटर्स तक जाने का जाने की संभावना है आई हैव रेड माई सेल्फ मदर ने ये लिखा है हमारी फिजिकल बॉडी बहुत स्ट्रॉन्ग हो जाएगी ठीक स्लिम हो जाएगी पावरफुल हो जाएगी हमारे अंदर सुपर नेचुरल पावर्स आएंगी हमारी सभी तरह की फिजिकल नीड्स भी कम हो जाएंगी सो आई आई एड्रेस इट दिस वे आपने पढ़ा कहीं से हाँ हाँ जरूर कौन से कौन सी बुक में काफी है काफी है एक मिनट एक मिनट हाँ आई विल पुट इट दिस वे वेन एवर देर इज एनी वर्क दैट वी डू ऑन आर सेल्स there is an effect in our environment so for example without even going to the body i'll come to the body but let's say we are able to work on our emotions and the way that we respond to people around us it has a direct effect on the nature of the interactions that we have with people so in a stressful situation for example if you have worked on yourself you respond differently so this is a work of the psychology now for shrobindo as we mentioned earlier his perspective of change and 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 consciousness was not restricted only to feelings or emotions or thoughts it was at every level so he says that with the passage of time as we continue working but this is a this is like the end of the movie right as we as we work on ourselves and we develop the mind and the feelings and the emotions and the body inevitably we will, we will be able to confront the limitations even of the body ultimately ultimately even the body can be transformed and changed but we cannot put the uh, cart before the horse that depends on you sir and on me and we have to see in ourselves whether it has started i don't know so both gautam and devdeep what a fascinating account of uh, window and you have most certainly drawn a lot of people into this and wanting to read the book i have one question we live in a world of skeptics non believers rationalists we don't want to get drawn or consumed like you two are by a philosophy which yes. is not which we can't see which is intangible i want to ask you the word in american is show me a sign hmm. have you seen signs um you know it began se several signs but today the now there are so many signs that i don't think signs or miracles are they mean mean anything to me anymore it's now a matter of fact we know we are there and we know shri aurobindo is with us and i think the two kind of feed each other uh you prefaced your question by saying we are mental beings and we don't do this and we don't do that etc ma'am with due respect i would like to say every person in this room when they bought a house must have done grih pravesh when they ma married they must have sung uh, had the mantras or whatever religion they follow when a child is born I, i'm sure there would be a namkaran uh, along with the tikka and that's the beautiful thing because it's not even as gautam is pointing out it's not a religion there is no thing that you have to do in order to call yourself a disciple you're not interested you're not interested in having a a, a list of adherents it doesn't matter they it didn't even matter to them in fact for orville the mother said you don't even have to consider shrobindo and the mother and and yourself as your spiritual teachers you can come from any tradition it hardly matters for orville she was as open as that i think the point is this there is a certain way of looking at the world that he presents through his writings and this way of looking at the world encompasses the material worlds right up to the spiritual realities and he simply says it's a question of seeing how that whole process or how that working takes place he himself didn't believe in miracles he says a, he would say a miracle is only something that you don't understand but even a miracle if it's explained as a process becomes no longer a miracle 
it becomes a consequence but of the problem. I think that's the question. Yes. Like for all of us in the yes. room, yes. you just said it. This yes. last point that you said yes. that as you move up the value chain, the yes. concept of a miracle is a scientific thing in your evolution moving up. I think the lady asked the same question that have you provided, provided your inner life is as active as your outer. That, that bridge, that conscious bridge needs to be built. Once that is built, it becomes very matter of fact. Actually, let, let me put it this way. Yeah. I truly believe. Let's, let's leave aside Shravinda and the mother. I feel all of us in our lives, whether we are uh, you know, materialists or rationalists or spiritually inclined, we have come across situations which are extraordinary and which are miracles. We all experience miracles. So there is nothing special that if you come to this path, there will be more miracles. Or it will become less if you go there. Our life, the fact that we live in this world is itself, I find, miraculous. To be alive and to be thinking and to be growing in these ideas. And so, the more we, we walk on that road, we move from miracle to miracle. So one last question. She's the boss. Yeah, I asked her. I asked her. Sarkin connection. Uh, one last question. You know, I just want to know whether, uh, to read or to go, what's okay. Uh, you have to have a minimum level of intellect or education because even I started reading Savitri, I just couldn't understand. <laughs> so, a man ke liye to mushkil hoga. And even a simple book of essays on Lita, I mean, you have to have a. I mean, English. So you can start with letters on yoga. Agar aapko hai. So you can start with letters on yoga. You can start with essays, uh, divine, essays, uh, divine and human and divine. Uh, or essays on philosophy and yoga. There are short two-page, three-page parts uh, which, 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 which they handhold you into the deeper aspects. But if you go to Life Divine, if you go to Savitri, yeah. and you will face this problem. I mean, I face this problem. It's not you. I think, I think the gentleman at the back had a yes. question for a long time. I have not read our window, but it's a little sort of correlated. Do you see a correlation between collective consciousness and AI? Because I believe that what you said earlier, today in our political space, in our society, or uh, in the religious spiritual place, there is more focus on personality. You know, we have this guru culture, it's not based on principles. We seek answers and then we go to personalities and what they say without a deeper sense of philosophy. And now we have gone to Twitter, which is 140 words, right? So most of mind space is occupied by right? Lesser people are reading books. But do you see technologically the human race coming in terms of, I'm not a techie, but in terms of chat, GPT, AI, also enhancing the journey on the spiritual side. I would say that uh, I think technology will take us there. Yeah. I think AI is getting us there. But I am not yet certain and therefore I am uh, using the word perhaps. I am not certain whether the, whether the matter as collated into intelligent bits and bytes and zeros and ones can become a conscious entity. I am not certain about that yet. Who knows, tomorrow it may be. But at this moment, through all my engagements that I have studied, read or understood in my limited manner, I am not a techie either. Uh, I don't think that technological leap has been taken where an inanimate object becomes conscious. Maybe tomorrow it will, at this moment I don't see it. Your window is always so cherishing because it leads us to deep wisdom and vision that are required to resolve the fundamental turmoil and issues that individuals, societies and nations face in the modern times. Many many thanks to Gautam Chikarwani and Devdev Ganguly for acquainting readers with the complete work and philosophies of the 20th century Indian philosopher Sage yoga guru, poet, nationalist, through the book, reading Sri Aurobindo. On behalf of Prabha Ketan Foundation, I, Anandmala Poddar, Ehsas Women at Delhi, express my sincerest gratitude to Mr. Ganguly and Mr. Chikarmani and conversationalist Puja Vanva. I take this golden opportunity to express a warm note of thanks to our patron, Sri Cement Limited, an eminence associate IIC. Last but not least, I convey a note of thanks to the guests who have gathered here for today's 
the right circle event. May I now request Karuna ji to please come up and felicitate the scholars. Thank you.